With the turning of the 20th century and the development of quantum mechanics, we are gradually able to fine-tune our search for this primacy of existence, of just what it is, we and everything else, at the smallest imaginable scales, is made of. But there is the box, in this case Schrodinger's box, and many other similar thought experiments that turn the tables on conventional or obvious, or even common sense, wisdom of what the world around us actually is. Mathematicians crunch the numbers while theoretical physicists try to posit solutions based on the evidence of current observation and found ways of testing those solutions in very complex ways we will not digress into here. But if ever a time came for thinking outside the box, this was it. Erwin Schrödinger was a physicist, a theoretical biologist, and probably more of a dog person. In the 1920s, scientists discovered quantum mechanics, which said that some particles are so tiny you can't even measure them without changing them. But the theory only worked if, before you measure them, the particle is in a superposition of every possible state all at the same time. To tackle that, Schrödinger imagined a cat in a box, with a radioactive particle and a Geiger counter attached to a vial of poison. If the particle decays, it triggers the Geiger counter, releases the poison, and bye-bye tittles. But if the particle is in two states, both decayed and not decayed, the cat is also in two states, both dead and not dead, until someone looks in the box. In practice, it's impossible to put a cat into a superposition. You'd have the animal rights lobby up in arms. But you can isolate atoms, and they do seem to be in two states at once. Quantum mechanics challenges our whole perception of reality, so maybe it's understandable that Schrödinger himself decided he didn't like it, and was sorry he ever started on about cats. One way in which physicists gained insight into what primacy is was to consider what it was not. What our reality is not, it appears, is the solid reality we assume it to be. Our first clue, the wave-particle duality, showed us this. As we more clearly understand the atom and the microscopic, we discovered the vast emptiness of matter, and with the macroscopic, the vast emptiness of space between the stars. We were not as much then the solid existence we imagined as a vast and endless wasteland of empty space at every scale, except, it seems, in our own little niche of just the right size. We generally consider matter to be solid and have substance, and that, like a loaf of bread, we can break matter into smaller and smaller bits. And centuries ago, the idea of the atom, or the smallest bit of matter, was formed. That which we call solid matter is anything but. Interestingly, for Mr. Faith in Physics, is the fact that many ancient religions tell us this, that life is an illusion, nothing more than smoke and mirrors. As far back as Plato, it's been suggested that what we see in the real world is in fact nothing but shadows cast on the wall of a cave. Matter is made of atoms. If you were to take a simple hydrogen atom and blow it up to macroscopic size, say that of a watermelon, then the orbiting electron, say a grapefruit, would be orbiting this watermelon at a distance of about 20 miles. That means that other than the watermelon and the grapefruit, in all of the two-dimensional slice of space that it comprises, out to the 20 miles is nothing but empty space. In 20 squared miles, nothing but a watermelon and a grapefruit.
We were all taught in school that the world is made of stuff, of matter, of mass, of atoms. Atoms make up molecules, molecules make up materials, and everything is made of that. But atoms actually are mostly empty. For example, if this ball were the nucleus of an atom, a proton and a hydrogen atom, for example, then the electron circling this, which would describe the outer limits of that atom, would be out by that mountain over there, roughly 20 miles away. And everything in between is empty. In fact, the universe is mostly empty. As we are taught, even the smallest of objects around you, say a coffee cup, is made of billions upon billions of individual atoms. And that's a big number. Or is it? Billions and billions of nothing is still nothing, or in our case, very little. Because those atoms are mostly nothing, the something is a minute fraction of the atom as an object. It's all that space and a tiny little speck of perhaps a few vibrating strings. That if you could probe smaller, much smaller than we can with existing technology, you'd find something else inside these particles. A little tiny vibrating filament of energy, a little tiny vibrating string. These little fundamental strings, when they vibrate in different patterns, they produce different kinds of particles. So electrons, quarks, neutrinos, photons, all other particles would be united into a single framework. What this means is that, for all that there is, the actual amount of information required to represent it is very small. In the final piece of the puzzle, black holes gave us the insight into the complex computational study of the universe as a data set and how that data might be stored on the surface of an event horizon. This is necessary in order to conserve the information because like matter and energy, the data which describes it must also only be able to change but never be created or destroyed. Modern ideas coming from black holes tell us that reality is two-dimensional, that the three-dimensional world, the full-bodied three-dimensional world, is a kind of image of a hologram on the boundary of the region of space. This is a very strange thing. When I was a younger physicist, I would have thought any physicist who said that was absolutely crazy. Here's a way to think about this. Imagine I took my wallet and threw it into a black hole. What would happen? We used to think that since nothing, not even light, can escape the immense gravity of a black hole, my wallet would be lost forever. But it now seems that may not be the whole story. Recently, scientists exploring the math describing black holes made a curious discovery. Even as my wallet disappears into the black hole, a copy of all the information it contains seems to get smeared out and stored on the surface of the black hole in much the same way that information is stored in a computer. So, in the end, my wallet exists in two places. There's a three-dimensional version that's lost forever inside the black hole and a two-dimensional version that remains on the surface as information. The information content of all the stuff that fell into that black hole can be expressed entirely in terms of just the outside of the black hole. In comparison, the outer surface of our universe, which is again compared to a two-dimensional film which envelops the three-dimensional space in which we exist, can contain all of the information necessary to project the three-dimensional objects inside of it because, as we have seen, the data set is much smaller than one might imagine. Enough so that it can easily fit the data to describe the particles in our three-dimensional space, which the two-dimensional flat surface envelops, and still have plenty of room left over. Um, here's an example. This is our room. Um, and I'm going to neglect all the chairs and the people in the room and I'm just going to focus on where actually a lot of the uh, uh, microscopic information is, which is in the movements of the individual little uh, molecules of air that are filling this room. Okay. 
Um, so, so these are these are lots of little little molecules. If you work it out, unless I made a mistake, there are about 10 to the 28 air molecules in this room. So that's one with 28 zeros. It's a lot of air molecules. And in this in this analogy that I was developing, you should think of each one of these air molecules as encoding a little bit of information. Each one of them is like a letter. Okay, if say, you know, we could say well, let's let's call nitrogen moving to the left A, oxygen moving down B and so on. Right? It, clearly we have more possibilities here than the number of letters in the alphabet, but but the idea is just to recognize that the state of a system can be viewed as as a paragraph full of letters, you know, as, as, a, as a piece of information. Beckenstein said very simply, well, let's just suppose that the entropy or information content of a black hole is equal to its area, measured in some suitable units that are constructed out of uh, the, the Newton's constant that measures the strength of gravity and, and Planck's constant that tells us the size of a quantum. Okay. Now this this quantity is supposed to be the entropy of a black hole. That was the new step. And it turns out that when you throw something into a black hole, the mass of the black hole grows. The radius of the horizon grows. Therefore, the area grows. And so there's something available that, that could have increased the total entropy, even though this, this information here was completely lost. Okay. And you can just think of that as just another one of these famous physical processes in which the complexity can only increase. The nice thing is that you know the final complexity. I've just told you. We have a black hole at the end, and the number of letters it has is measured by the area of this surface, of this, of this, of this event horizon. Okay. And so the number of letters we needed to describe the system we started with has to be less than or equal to that by the second law. By doing this little thought experiment of converting this room into a black hole of the same surface area, we're learning that the initial information must have been less than the final information content, which we know how to compute, that of the black hole. So it must have been less than the surface area. And so this is the sense in which, in which the world can be thought of as a hologram. I'm guaranteed that I can completely specify the state that this room is in, down to the smallest detail you can imagine, by writing little letters, even just ones and zeros, on the walls of this room at a density of about one per Planck area. In trying to explain these disturbing discoveries, it was proposed that if mankind in our current state were able to create quantum computers and other highly sophisticated modeling capabilities, what about those cultures which have been around much longer than we have? It might be implied that if we do it, they do it better. There might be a huge number of such computer modeling or simulations taking place. There is, therefore, certain odds that we could be living in one of them. A holographic projection is a projection which creates an illusion. It's not real, in the sense that it is not self-existent. It is created. Maybe there's a hint there. If we consider reality as a kind of quantum computer simulation, matter consisting now only as data and not as a wave or particle, but rather as a kind of computer bit which represents the presence of energy as a one and the absence of energy in any given region of space-time as a zero. This data is stored on the outer surface of the universe and is likened to the two-dimensional holographic film which contains all the data necessary to project a three-dimensional object. You can now walk around and see the back sides or the back of an object just as if it were there. But it's more like the holodeck on the Enterprise than what we expected solid reality to be. I fold as well. The uncertainty principle will not help you now, Stephen. Hmm? All the quantum fluctuations in the universe will not change the cards in your hand. <laughs> I call. You are bluffing, and you will lose. Wrong again, Albert. Phil. Hmm. Red alert. All personnel report to duty stations. We will have to continue this another time. 
End program. Oddly enough, this illusory nature of reality has been taught by Eastern philosophies for centuries. It's just an illusion. And it seems they win the prize. Then it might be that everything in the universe, from galaxies and stars to you and me, even space itself, is just a projection of information stored on some distant two-dimensional surface that surrounds us. In other words, what we experience as reality may be something like a hologram. Is the three-dimensional world an illusion in the same sense that a hologram is an illusion? Perhaps. I think, I'm inclined to think, yes, that the three-dimensional world is a kind of illusion and uh, that the ultimate precise reality is the two-dimensional reality at the surface of the universe.